Hi, everybody. What? Uh, I don't know where you are in the world, but it was a beautiful day here in Philadelphia. And I am so excited to be capping off the, the first couple weeks of this month where we've talked about so many issues facing old cats. And tonight we're going to get it. We're going to get it all together for longevity in cats. And before I introduce our esteemed guest, I have a super exciting announcement. As you know, if you're tuning in with Base Paws, Base Paws is a cat health and dental health company. And that's why we talk to you about all these great issues. So they just added 80 health markers to their testing, which is really mind blowing. You guys, this is science happening right in front of us. This is pretty awesome. Um, so check on check on your, your accounts and look into it because 80 new markers, that's 120 health markers for cats. So uh, right now we are going to get started. And I wanted to introduce you to my dear friend and world famous feline veterinarian, Dr. Marky Sherrick. Hey, always, oh, lovely yes. to, always lovely to see you and interact with you. Like we just did this a couple of weeks ago. That was, that was good. And um, it's as close as we get to be these days, which kind of sucks. I look forward to, you know, actually seeing you in person, um, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. We should maybe do a, a uh, tour where we go to every city and yeah. talk to grandparents because you and I yeah. mostly speak to other veterinarians yeah and um, veterinary staff yeah 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 so it would be super fun to go yeah get the real cat parents exactly yeah. would be yeah. great wouldn't it so we're going to talk about longevity in cats um where should we start well why don't we start here you know how do i care for my senior cat and that because that's really what we're what we're um talking about here um and oh this let me just we've just got some stuff coming up in the box here so i'm getting to getting uh, distracted by that shame on me uh, so <laughs> what we're yeah what we're talking about here is you know like i think we really need to start with well what is a what is a senior cat um and the aafp uh created these wonderful guidelines um, feline life guide stage guidelines, which have been just put in the chat box. And in those, the senior cats are defined as cats who are over 10 years of age. So those are the precious kitties we're going to be talking about. And like we said before, I, um, to me, these guys are the ones I really, really super, super uh, enjoy. Not to say that kittens aren't a whole lot of fun, um, but these are the cats who we've really bonded to ov over time. So they're super, super close. So t 10 feels young. To yeah, it does to me too. It does to me too. Yeah. But then if we look at that list, it says that um, uh, 65 is uh, like a, tw a 12 and a half year old, 12 and a half year right. young cat. And uh, that that senior and I'm 65 and I object to that label um <laughs> i am not senior so so i think it's some i think it's somewhat what's similar and maybe over time uh it's going to the the definition is going to change because you know it used to be that that what you know when i was growing up um, uh, an old cat was some um, seven or eight so yeah you know no, cats are getting into their 30s you know it, many cats are getting into their 20s and some of them are getting to their 30s as well we we have all heard of that um saying that dog years, right? Like, so if a dog is one, that's equivalent to seven. Um, how, how does that work with, um, with cats? Is it, is well, there like a, a straight line? Yeah, no, it's not a straight line. It doesn't work in dogs either. Cause if you look at this table, you can see that, you know, one month is a year and two months is four years and then, or three months rather, and then six months is, is 10 years. So it, it, it's really, it's an exponential. It's a sharp curve up initially and then things slow down because then when you get to um you know if you look at the human years on the right hand side things start to things start to slow down around two years of age then they they kind of start chugging along at a more so walk me through it i think on the next slide we have um we have how that's broken down 
Yeah, sure. Here we go. Yeah. So yeah, these these guidelines, which I highly recommend you, you download, they talk about kitten, which is up to a year, and then young adults is one to six. Then mature adults is seven to 10. Senior is um, uh, above 10. Or and, 10 and, and above. You know, this is this information is actually available. So I just want to pause here and say that um, we you you guys can get real quality veterinary information by checking out uh, catvets.com. The the um, the initials AAFP, which is what we call it, um, has been the URL got stolen by human doctors. Uh, so, so we can't use that one. So we are going to have a of, of uh, family practitioners. Exactly. Yeah, and just for them, you know, but That's the feelings are our family. So we got catvets.com and you guys can check. There's amazing resources there. So some of the stuff that we say, you're like, what? I want to know more about that. Or, or where that doesn't make sense. It will, if you have any questions, check out catvets.com and also cat healthy. Um, where can they find cat healthy? Well, cat, it's cathealthy.com. But if you go to catvets.com, you'll go, there's a section about cat healthy and if, or, or pardon me, not cat healthy, sorry, cat friendly and underneath cat friendly. Um, yeah. So cat healthy is cathealthy.ca because uh, uh, CA refers to Canada. So uh, cathealthy.ca and there's some really good information there too. Awesome. Okay. So the thing is that, you know, as, as cats age, like as they go through these different stages, kitten, um, young adult, uh, mature adult, and then senior, uh, their needs change, right? Same as yeah. ours, you know, really yeah. no different than ours, is it? Yeah. So, so you, what you're saying is like that, that it, their aging actually is accelerated. And so we've got to think ahead yeah. and make sure that we're, we are changing our expectations for how we care for them quicker than you'd think right so well, check, like oh my gosh i didn't i forgot he was 11. yeah you know that happens yeah well we're busy with our lives our cats get older same as we do only they get older faster the other thing too <laughs> is is that their needs as they you know the needs of an older cat are different than the needs of a kitten you know with with a kitten you know both nutritionally you're going to feed them for growth you're also going to just like somebody who a, a pregnant cat you're going to feed them um uh for for uh, pregnancy and and lactation, um, uh, but you also with the uh, as you know senior cats, uh, adult cats need fewer calories. Senior cats need more calories and more protein. So their nutritional needs change, and so do also the sorts of illnesses they're going to get. You know, you're not. It's really unlikely that you're going to find diabetes or hyperthyroidism in a young cat. And, and um, you're in a young cat. We're thinking more about accidents and and parasites and and infectious diseases and and uh which isn't to say that older cats can't get those and it also isn't to say that young cats can't get cancer but it's much less likely so, so this so is why we need to do check like? hmm? what what do those things look like like what should we be looking out for well any any changes in in um how they're doing uh it, you know if and we talked about uh the subtle signs of sickness in, a couple of weeks ago Let's just go to the next slide because I think you lay it out really nicely there. Okay, sure, we'll do. Just want to say that this is why you know we need to be uh, uh, checking for them. So the sorts of changes that we see as cats get older. Sorry, Liz, I wasn't sure that you were talking about older cats. <laughs> are changes in behavior and sleeping patterns. Uh, that's one thing. Then we also are are thinking about um, uh, ch the increased talking or meowing. You know, we we use the term vocalization, but it seems so clinical to say that. Yeah, increased, increased, um, yada, yada. Anybody who's had a cat with the uh, increased talking, they know it's not like a whisper. Uh, yeah. Cats that are yowling at night is a, it's a very, almost, it's a little distressing, you know, it's a very, yeah. It's eerie. But it may, they may also just be talking more um, throughout the day too. They may be, you know, giving you updates on everything and chit chatting. <laughs> um, we have to be looking for, um, changes in how they move, you know, pain related uh, uh, to movement that they're, instead of jumping up, they're kind of using a stair to, or a, a, a chair to get onto the table and, or, or if they're using the stairs going up or down, maybe not quite as quickly as they used to, or uh, that, that they have difficulties getting into the, uh, into or out of the litter box. Um, and you know, I think this is so interesting because we think of, you know, I'm a horse person. I know you are too. And, uh, and people and dogs, when, when they're in pain, they show us a, a signal that we, we really get quickly. So if they're limping, you're like, oh, that hurts. And a cat's not necessarily going to limp, which just, is so hard. They just lie still. 
Yeah. It's not like a dog where you throw a Frisbee and they go racing after it, or they don't. It's cats, you know, we come home and they're still uh, asleep in the same place they were when we left, you know, so we can't see that they're, that they're hurting. Yeah. Uh, there may also be changes in their vision um, or their hearing where they're not just ignoring you, even though they might be, um, but they also have a bit of a, bit of a hard time um, seeing, seeing things. I'll talk about that when I talk about nighttime, nighttime yowling. They also, their other senses can also be decreased, namely smell and taste. And that can mean that they all of a sudden don't like what they used to eat or because they can't taste it um, anymore, or uh, they are liking other things. So changes in, in the sorts of things that they like is, is really important or they can't smell it. And smell of course is, you know, part of, you know, when you you walk into a, it's the old uh, real estate thing. You walk into a home and it smells like freshly baked bread and you feel like you're home, you know, and it's just came from a spray. But anyways, it's, it's that sort of thing. I mean, it makes you hungry, right? Um, weight loss and, and uh, uh, loose skin, weight and muscle loss, that's, they're really, really important uh, in, in cats. Having brittle nails or really thick nails that have to be trimmed more often. It's kind of like walking in high heels all the time or with that's a stone one that, in your face. That's one that sneaks up on us because um, it's kind of easy to forget. And actually, um, let's see this all the time where the nail actually goes all the way around oh, yeah. the circle. Yeah, and it goes right back in. The paw and can be infected and like, like give, they're giving themselves their own piercing. And, and it's, I, and and the cat might not even be limping on that. Yeah. yeah. So it's something that if you have a geriatric cat, take an extra look and remind yourself, maybe even put something in your phone to yeah. remind yourself to just make sure that those nails are getting trimmed regularly because that's that's very avoidable. And when someone has it, if you feel really bad because yeah. you didn't mean that. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and also you know, uh, because they, I, I already said, cats, older cats need more calories and they need more protein and, and fat because they have a, a decreased ability to absorb uh, their nutrients. And because they're prone to dehydration, uh, they they also are more likely to be constipated. And I'm excited to when we get down to uh, we have a lot of great things to talk about, but it's um, you know nutrition isn't one thing. No. So we really need to update not not just the amount of knowledge that's out there but we need to think about the different needs as your cat ages and and that's really interesting so someone named Kristen schumacher knows you oh, and hey, she says yeah. her, her kitty he's solomon 18. uh is 18. he's 18 and yeah. he's vocalizing a lot now and um she feels like she's got to calm him down and hold him um and sounds like he's he's walking room to room and maybe not knowing where he is. And um, the vet seem, seems to think everything's okay. Um, what do you think about nighttime yowling and being distressed like that? Yeah, well, night you know nighttime yowling uh, for sure is a is a thing, and it's that wow that really eerie sound at, at night, and it can be due to uh, a, de a decrease in their ability to um, hear or see. They can't see that you've gone to bed. Um, they, so, you know, you need to, uh, maybe put up some, you know, just put up some night lights, uh, to help them. Uh, maybe they can't, and you've probably seen in older cats, uh, I don't know whether, um, Solomon's got sort of a cloudiness to his eyes. If you catch it, like, kind of like if you've drunk some milk, the, and what's left in the glass, that little film, um, or when you, um, uh, if he may not be able to hear if you're, as you move through the house. And so you need to, you know, make some noise and say, I'm up here, silly, or whichever. <laughs> um, also blood pressure, blood pressure, blood pressure. I really would love to see you know, vets measuring blood pressure in every patient um, at every visit, uh, but it's certainly from um, uh, three years of age onwards in every patient. Uh, and to check uh, if they're hypertensive because high blood pressure will make you agitated as well hyperthyroidism. And Kristen, I, I suspect that your veterinarian has checked um, for th thyroid conditions numerous times. Um, pain is something that we are, uh, that's, that's a difficult one for, because with pain, we just want to assume that they're in pain, give them something for it and see if their behavior changes um if they you know are acting more like they did six months 12 months two years ago um gosh he's a new cat doc you know he's he's playing <laughs> like a kitten again so then you kind of go 
geez, you know, I'm really sorry, Kitty, that we didn't pick this up before, but I'm really glad we now know that, you know, we can give you pain relief and you feel better. And then cognitive dysfunction or, um, which is, you know, a polite way of, of saying, um, uh, well, cats actually do get Alzheimer's, but uh, it, the, uh, you know, senility, some type of uh, cognitive uh, issue there, that does happen in cats. The only way to test for it is to rule, or the only, there is no, there are no tests. The only thing we can do is rule out all the other things that, that I've um, just talked, talked about there. Yeah. So I no really cloudiness. He does have his blood pressure done every three to four months. Excellent. So it could, you know, it's possible that he's got, I, I, I'd try some pain um, medication uh, for uh, three to five days, maybe even a week and see um, how he, uh, how he, how he does. Um, and we're getting and a lot of questions also about um, how we check blood pressure. And actually I spoke with uh, the cat LVT last night, Ellen Carroza, and we did a whole thing on blood pressure. So I think you can get it on the Base Paws YouTube channel. Um, and uh, but quickly, will you tell us how we we check the blood pressure? Oh sure, yeah. I mean, blood pressure absolutely can be checked in in um, upset kitties. Um, in, in because just like us, you your blood pressure may go up a little bit from being stressed, but it can't go sky high because if it goes um, sky high, you uh, you'll you'll your your blood vessels will burst. Okay, mm -hmm. so you'll you you know, and and we're set for dealing with a bear chasing us or whatever. So that's that's not a not a concern. The thing is, is in fact, in the reference ranges for blood pressure for cats, cats' blood pressure is just like like ours. It should be one hundred and twenty over eighty. Um, we only use the top number because the bottom number is is uh, less reliable in cats. So we use the top number. So we say normals up to one hundred and forty. So that already gives wiggle room right there. And so if it is plus when we're in the vet, uh, you know, when we've got our, our, our kitties in the clinic, when we're measuring blood pressure there, we're taking, you know, um, seven to eight to nine measurements. We're dropping the first one because we know that one's going to be high. And then we're, you know, averaging out the rest to get a, a more reliable reading. You can um, also... Uh, for people who give their kitties gabapentin before they go into the clinic to make it a less um, frightening um, experience. And hopefully, you know, I want the clinics to be um, set up so that and, and everybody in the clinic to be acting in such a way that cats don't have to be frightened, um, don't have to feel self-defensive. But in any case, if cat, cat is on gabapentin, that does not affect blood pressure values so it doesn't artificially lower them because they're drugged or anything like that so and you, you know i just want to say reliable values. i want to say also that um you know we in vet school you've got to learn at least six species very thoroughly and um i mean i'm just gonna throw the vet schools under the bus we get a lot of dog and not a lot of cat and and when i graduated from vet school i also thought it was too hard to get a blood pressure and then every cat would freak out. And so it wouldn't mean anything. So I was not going to do it. Yeah. Um, and that is really common. That is a common misconception for vets who yeah. haven't gone the extra mile to really focus on cats. I haven't had the opportunity um, or taken the opportunity to learn more specifically about, about cats. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and also the staff. So we, you can't really do everything all by yourself. So you need staff that is comfortable helping you with a blood pressure. Yeah. So if if you want to take a look at a vet who is focusing on cats, take a look at that catvets.com for uh, cat friendly practice and cat friendly veterinarians because they near done... me. Yeah, you can yeah. look up cat friendly yeah. veterinarians near me. And you can ask your vet. You said no, I watched that thing. I watched Dr. Margie Sherrick. She said it's important. Maybe we could learn it together. Yeah. There yeah. we go. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So um, we had talked before about weight. And I think it's really tricky because there's so much focus on cats being fat. But this shift starts to happen where um, the, the it's more than just not being fat. The body composition changes. Talk, yeah. talk to me about that. Yeah, so we know that um, just like with with us, as we get older, our muscles start. We start losing muscle mass, and um, while our weight may uh, stay the same or drop or increase, our body, even if our weight decreases, our percentage of fat increases. So muscle decreases, fat increases, and that's not good. And if and then if add to that, you're actually losing weight 
all, all around um, completely went, that's, that is an indicator that, um, that increases your risk for developing disease and it increases your, your risk for, and when I say your, I mean cat, but also person, your um, risk for a uh, premature death. So it's really, Whoa. really important. You know, we know that with cancer, we know with kidney disease, we know with thyroid disease, we know with other things, um, that that a decrease in weight actually precedes our ability to make the to even measure those parameters we use to make a diagnosis. So, so Kristen, Kristen's asking um, how much body weight is considered normal for a really old cat. Is How much body mass or weight loss is considered normal? Yeah, weight normal? loss is considered normal if you're 17 or older. Well, we don't really want to see any, um, ideally. And so this is why muscle condition scoring is so super important. And uh, there's a link I'll show you later on to how you can learn how to uh, body and muscle condition score your cat. And um, that's really important because when I see a cat who's got decreased muscle, I'm talking about changing nutrition. Even if they've got kidney disease, whatever, I need to get more protein uh, into their bodies, not just in their food. It actually has to be absorbed into their bodies. Really, really um, yeah, Im important. So, so um, how, how would someone f find that out? Wh what their cat should be eating and, and um, you know, if things are changing, should they change the food? Well, talk, I mean, certainly talking to a, a board certified veterinary nutritionist would be great, would be absolutely awesome like dr uh julie churchill who we um had you know well last month i think it was when we talked about she and i had a fireside chat about chronic kidney disease she's a board certified nutritionist um different veterinarians and 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 in uh, some cases also uh veterinary technicians uh, are really really keen on nutrition and uh can can uh, really help you there but not from i would not get information uh from from the the internet that's for sure there's a so lot how of does someone, like, how would someone even find a board certified veterinary nutritionist a if ACVN, you would go to the acvn um website and which i don't know offhand what their url is but it's the american college of veterinary nutritionists i'll try um, to post so, it yeah so we could just chat. just just look that up there yeah and, and are they doing virtual appointments or like because i'm wondering mm. you know there's there's so few veterinary nutritionists to there's get real few. scientific yeah. information it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had the down low on that. I, I, I do not. Um, see, yeah, the American College of Veterinary Nutritionists and uh, balanceit.com, they're all staffed by mm. veterinary nutritionists. Every, every veterinary teaching hospital, every veterinary school, uh, I think everyone has a nutritionist, but I, I, I sure as I hope so. Anyways, yes, Carol, that was ACVN. Okay. And, um, you know, I know you talk about this a lot to, to us, to the veterinarians, because there's so, sort of a, um, a difference of opinion that older cats should get less protein because they're, the thought is that it will be hard on their kidneys. Hmm. And you disagree with that because hmm. Ivy said that her, she hmm. hears a lot of vets say less protein. Hmm. What, we're after, what we're after is less phosphorus and uh, amino acids, the building blocks of protein contain phosphorus as, you know, as part of the backbone of the molecule. Um, so, which is why people say less protein, but what we need is um, uh, low pro low phosphorus proteins. Um, and we need, and the reality of it is, is that cats with kidney disease live a long, long time. Again, we were taught to think about dogs and dogs with kidney disease, they don't live very long, six months, something like that. I don't know. Um, uh, <laughs> but with, with cats, they'll live six or 10 years with kidney wow. disease. So we want to, we have to actually meet the needs of the older cat because the older cat is is someone who is um, uh, you know the older cat is uh, is it has different needs they need more protein they need more fat um, uh, so that's the thing so uh, uh, Kristen uh, from base has said Dr Churchill is doing some virtual um, oh great uh, right now so that's really great, great. it's really great yeah, yeah. so um, back to Kristen's question before about losing body mass yeah you know even so how do i tell if my cat has lost a pound like that's really hard well this is where you know we want to uh, have scales uh and not your bathroom scale because um our bathroom scales are not sensitive enough to detect the small changes that are very significant in cats because you know for a cat if a cat loses um 0.1 of a pound 
that's 10% of their weight, which would be equivalent to 14 pounds on me. You know, so there's a big difference, right? Then, then you know, because uh, uh, whereas 0 0.1 of a pound on uh, on on me would be nothing, you know, and absolutely nothing. So our scales are not designed. So cat scales are, or baby scales are, you know, they can be readily gotten from. Where, anywhere. where do you get a good one? Do you know? Like, could you just go on Amazon and get one? I just go on Amazon. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly, I honestly don't know, but get a baby scale. Really, really important. Um, and, you know, this just shows some of the science behind, like I said before, that with chronic kidney disease, weight loss begins three years before we're even able to detect it, whether it's yeah. SPMA or creatinine or urine specific gravity, three years before Wait a that. Minute. Weight loss begins three years before we can even tell that the kidneys are changing? Yep. And with cancer, wow. kidney disease and hyperthyroidism, weight loss begins two and a half years before they die. Okay, so wow. that's not before we detect the disease, but before they die. And then with other diseases, you know, weight loss can begin, you know, uh, also, you know, over three years before they, um, uh, before they die. So getting a, oh, uh, Sandra says she got a good uh, scale from Zeiss. Well, of course, Zeiss is going to be great, great quality stuff for <laughs> sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So actually, no. you know, with that, this, this, this table, which is uh, uh, from a, a Vet Focus article, which you can get um, uh, online, you just, it's, it's free to anybody, Vet Focus. Um, and if you look this up, and there's lots of comorbidities or, or joint conditions in underweight cats. So cats with, uh, you know, uh, and there, you can see, I just highlighted some at the bottom, um, cats with, with one thing often, if they're underweight, often have another disease. And that's the thing, right, Liz, with, with cats as they get older, they don't just have one problem. They've got lots of them. Like they'll have, they'll, you know, it's not at all un unbelievable that a cat may be hyperthyroid, have kidney disease, diabetes, um, and arthritis, hypertension, and dental disease all in, in one cat. We could, throw in a, we could throw in a heart murmur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so the thing is, I want to say, you know, I think I know I'm going to speak for myself. I love being a veterinarian. I don't like being a, a patient and I don't like my animals being a patient and I don't want to know bad news. But the thing is, we shouldn't think about these age related. I don't know. I want to rebrand it hurdles that we're coming up against. It's actually very normal yes. to have to deal with a bunch of stuff to keep your cat healthy. Well, so and I can, sorry, I was just going to say, you know, I'm speaking to myself as much as everybody else to try to not bury your head in the sand and go to that veterinary appointment for cats older than 10, twice a year. And it was older than 14. It's quarterly. Is that right? Yeah, well, tw twice. It, yeah, over fourteen. That's that's absolutely right. Um, over fourteen, we want to go uh, every uh, uh, for, every four months or so. Um, yeah, like that. But visit them. But what what I was going to say too is that I really like your idea. It was actually a client who um, I was explaining to her that her cat had uh, a decline in kidney function, um, which is something that I would expect in any cat over 11 or 12 years of age. That just comes with the territory. And so she said, ah, so you're telling me it's age appropriate. And I love mm -hmm. that terminology. It is age appropriate. In fact, if I see an 18 year old cat who's got um, pristine kidneys, that's even though it's right. falling within the reference range and it's all normal. That's not normal. Yeah. That's not what I expect. It's not you what know, I and this is a great all. question. It's, um, Ivy said, if we can keep their weight normal, can we avoid comorbidities? Yeah. Some of them, right? Well, some of them. Well, some of them. So this is an interesting thing. It's, uh, um, we don't want them to be fat. Okay. But, but, um, there's, there's this, uh, um, paradox exists in human medicine as well. If you are morbidly obese, have a, if you have a, you know, you are at greater risk for certain conditions, heart disease. We know what, we all know these things, right? Heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. And same thing if you're a cat, but, um, if you are slightly overweight or ideal weight, when you are diagnosed with these conditions, you will respond, even cancer, you will respond more favorably than if you are underweight or obese. 
Okay, so we really want to keep them at an ideal weight or slightly over, which is how I try and comfort myself. Um, <laughs> uh, that that it's that I'm actually yes, uh, somebody made a comment here about uh, about fat phobia. Right, Brooke said there's so much fat phobia rhetoric around humans and cats. This is news to me. We don't. The thing is, you don't want somebody to be obese because obesity, in and unto itself, is an inflammatory condition, and it causes uh, it causes other like if you have arthritis and you are and and you're overweight if you're a cat again i'm saying if a, if a cat is overweight and is, or is obese and has arthritis their arthritis will be worse partly because of the excess weight on those joints but partly also because of the inflammation that the fat um, in and unto itself um, causes so that's a uh that is a um uh, a very real, real thing. So uh, Stephanie has a good question here, and I yeah. just want to go to the next slide if I can here. So we talk about, you know, Stephanie said, one of my cats, 11, he's overweight and has been on a diet for one and a half years. He's lost about two pounds. He's about 25 pounds now, but he's a big cat. Uh, that's, that's what I always say, but I have that's big bones. Bad. And the vet said he should be about 18 pounds. He's eating a lower calorie diet uh, from the vet and it's working, but recently I feel he's crying for more food uh, for food more often. How do I know if he just needs more calories because he's getting older? I don't want him to have health issues from being overweight, but now I'm concerned uh, learning aging cats need more calories. He doesn't need more calories um, just because if he's already overweight, he's he's fine calorie wise because there's a difference between um, all calories and protein calories. Calories come from protein, fat and carbohydrates. But what we see with um, inadequate protein is we start seeing muscle loss. Now the sarcopenia that I talked about, that's a normal age related change and it's unrelated to disease, but that's why we do resistance training. That's why we lift weights, you know, or um, uh, because uh, it, we need to keep our muscles up to help stabilize us for balance so we don't fall. Um, we also need to, uh, uh, by resistance training keeps our bones strong by stretching the ligaments on, on the bones. So it's really important. And what we see in cats compared to dogs or people, or compared to dogs or people, is that the lean body mass drops dramatically in cats as they get older. Um, and, and so we really have to watch that. And so if you have a cat who has, a, for instance, chronic kidney disease and is on a restricted protein, uh, is on a renal diet, renal diets have, have, have attributes um, uh, beyond uh, restricting protein, aka phosphorus, and th with that, the um, uh, those uh, 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 if that cat is losing muscle mass, then that's a real problem because that the cats are have such a high requirement for protein that if they don't get enough protein in their food, they'll take it from their muscles. And if they take it from their muscles, their kidneys still have to do the whole digestion thing. Well, they don't digest it, but they still have to excrete the endogenous, their own protein that they've catabolized from their muscle. So we don't want to see that. We want to maintain their muscle and hence muscle condition scoring. This isn't just unique to cats. Sorry, Liz. I was just going to go back to Stephanie and say the the only the only addition that I'm thinking of is there's a change, right? So he's asking for food more often and crying. So it's worth a visit to the vet and some blood work because uh, maybe it's just that he wants more volume, but maybe it's hyperthyroidism or pain or something else. So the thing is, cats don't have a lot of specific ways of telling us there's trouble. Yeah. So. Um, crying more, we we interpret what we think it is, but we're not always right. So um, I think I just wanted to to bring that up that it, we you might be absolutely right that he just wants more food, but maybe not. Yeah. So it might be with a trip to the vet and some blood work. Yeah, and this is this is the thing, definitely blood work, because if I hear that a, that a cat who was previously overweight, it's such a, it's, it's almost a, stereotype when I get somebody whose cat was overweight and they say, you know, doc, I'm so pleased that he's, you know, he's finally after two and a half years of feeding him the diet, the, the lower calorie diet that I've been um, uh, forced to buy from you over all this, this expensive food I've been forced to buy from you for these last two and a half years. Um, poking fun here now, Stephanie. And uh, if he is, uh, he's finally, it's working. He's finally losing weight. And if he's, you know, if it's an, if it's an, uh, cat, uh, if it's a senior cat, I'm immediately going, wait, is this hyperthyroidism? Is this diabetes? What's going on here? Because it's a mean trick, right? Because yeah, we've been trying so trick. hard 
so long. Yeah. And we think we're we think we're doing a great thing, but it turns out it's actually a disease process. Yeah, exactly. And the you know, so that whole sarcopenia thing though, this their age related changes in people as well, as you can as you can see here. Yay, double the fat from healthy young to senior 75, not there yet. Um uh, with bones, decreased bone mass and um, muscle half, just horrible, horrible, hate it, absolutely hate it. So we want to monitor their weight, get a baby scale, get a baby scale, get a baby scale uh, and muscle condition. And here's the link for how to, you know, perform a muscle um, condition uh, exam, which you can just, you know, you can uh, go to and I won't show it now because we've got so many other things that we need to cover. You know, I love Brooke's question. Is there tra physical training, resistance training, or physical therapy that you can do for cats to help build muscle mass? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Cats aren't so, quite as amenable as, as dogs are to this. You can certainly do, um, uh, you can certainly do this, uh, uh, you know, do resistance training with them. You can even sort of put them over a, a body ball and, and um, uh, you know, get them to push against it. But uh, by and large, the, the, the most effective way is putting them into a water, um, into a, onto a water treadmill. Um, needless to say, we don't have a lot of those floating around. Um, <laughs> I'm not intended. But you, and you can do appropriate things to get them moving, like playing every day, if you yes. can, and play in a way that, that, um, is up, you're up to your cat's abilities. You know, if, if they're struggling and you play too hard, you know, just like us, that might be a little hard on them yeah. and moving their, their food around the house so that they have an incentive to get up and move and not just sleep all day. Yeah. Um, you know, cat exercise wheel, someone suggested that's great. And, uh, uh, if, if, you know, if you, if you've got the space and, the and the, uh, wherewithal to, to do that and, and your cat likes it, you know, laser pointer on the, on the wheel to get them walking on it, cat treadmill, same sort of thing. Um, while holding him, uh, will holding him while gently bouncing on a rebounder do, do any good. Um, while gently bouncing him on the rebounder, not you rebounding, <laughs> I'm assuming. Uh, possibly, possibly, possibly. You guys are the nicest people in the world. You would do anything for your cat. Yeah, you guys are fantastic, food. right? Great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so is there senior food? Like, is there is there a catch all that I can say I can just go do this and it's going to be okay, or do I need a nutritionist? Uh, well, again, I think that it, it, you have to, your veterinarian should, by looking at both body condition scoring, which is the right amount of calories, too many calories or too few calories kind of thing, as well as muscle condition scoring, which talks about are, are, is the, are, is the, what's the muscle? Is that Are we feeling more loss in muscle or is the cat still got lots of muscle? You know, when you stroke down their back, is it brrr, down piano keys? And when you stroke over their head, are, are you feeling sunken muscle? Or do you, are you seeing sunken muscle in their thighs? Like um, actually here on, on Nimitz or here on this cat too. Um, so, you know, what's, go what's going on there? Um, uh, well, I think that the point is that there really isn't a one size fits all and mm. to give your older cat the best chance it has to a happy and healthy life. It's back to that relationship with the vet and regular appointments Yeah, with someone who really wants to talk about this stuff and, yeah. and, um, engage in this longevity. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, so what, weight actually can, if you're too heavy and you're arthritic can cause pain. Um, how do we know if our cats are painful? Well, this is the thing. I mean, in people, we use these Likert scales or these, you know, scales like um, you can say how bad you are. But with our, a lot of older cats are in pain. Um, and so some things that we can do are, is to, we've already talked about difficulties getting up, standing or walking kind of stiff when you get up and then you walk it off kind of thing, joints and back pain. And, and so here's some simple questions simple, simple questions you can, you know, ask yourself is, you know, does your cat jump up normally? Uh, does your cat uh, jump down normally? Does your cat climb up or hesitate before they jump? Um, and what's the difference? Why, why just up or just down? What, what's the difference? Well, the up reflects the back end, right? You're pushing off the back and down reflects landing on your, like your shoulders, your elbows and your wrists, oh, right? Okay. So those are the difference. And then same thing with climbing upstairs um, uh, or, or downstairs, again, back end or front end. Uh, does your cat run normally? Um, 
does your cat run? <laughs> <It's> more, <laughs> I always think that's a fun question. It's like, does your cat chase moving objects such as toys and are a laser pointer? Because cats, Andrew says that, you know, uh, he plays with his cat with a laser pointer, which is great. Make him walk up and down the stairs and climb the cat tree. That's fantastic. Um, because, you know, this is, uh, cats, if they're not in pain, they should be very willing to pay, play. They should be very willing to play. Even an old cat? Even an old cat. Um, not playing has got nothing to do with age. It's got to do with um, pain or de and pain also means dehydration too. It's not, if they're not growing out of it, we're just too getting too serious as we get older. Yeah. I don't think so. I think that's just, yeah. just becoming cynical because of the state of the world. Maybe I should just be speaking <laughs> for myself. Yeah. So how else can we tell uh, the, about pain? What are, what are some other clues? There's lots of lots of things here, you know, decreased appetite or no interest in food, which, you know, also looks like, um, uh, you, know, I, you know, Teresa has mentioned that her older cat hadn't had dental cleanings and she had to have many, many teeth removed. And that will have been really um, uh, painful for the kitty before she had the teeth removed. And now it's, you know, much better being withdrawn or hiding, just not as interactive. Um, uh, reduced movement, we've talked about a lot, decreased exercise tolerance and general activity. Again, not as easy to tell as in a dog because we don't ask much of cats, you know, other than to lie around, right? Decreased grooming where they're getting mats on their, um, over their, just above their tail and their lower back. Uh, that can be from, from pain or, and that pain could be in their spine. It could be in their mouth that it hurts. Um, the uh, changes in, in urination or defecation habits where they are, they, if the litter box is only on one level of your house and it's too far to get there, they may have to go somewhere else, use, you know, pee or poop somewhere else, or maybe they're peeing and pooping right outside the box and you notice that their front end's in the box and that's because they can't arch their back enough, or maybe the edge of the box is too high. Like most boxes are, are about four inches high, the edge, which is the entire length that'd be right up to our groin. If you think about it, that's the whole length wow. of a cat's leg. You know, I, I have to say this too. I don't, we didn't really talk a lot about musculoskeletal disease in cats mm. um, in vet school. Mm. And when I first got out and you'd be taking an x-ray of a cat's belly mm. or lungs, we, we call it a catagram because usually the whole cat will fit yeah. on, on one cassette. Um, and then the amount of cat spines with horrible arthritis, yeah. very young was amazing to me that that cats get a lot of a, a lot of painful conditions in their back yeah and and arthritis actually has been shown to start as uh, as young as um uh as young as uh, one year of age in cats what? we tend to we you know we used to think about it being strictly uh you know above nine or something like that but it, it starts really young i don't know i'm out of focus here stop with that <laughs> It must just be the general state of things. <laughs> so someone is also asking about, you know, right down there, you have ex uh, decreased grooming. What about excessive grooming? Yeah, excessive grooming and um, can be definitely from pain. It's kind of like rubbing your, you know, rubbing a kid's tummy if they have a tummy ache. You know, it's how they're doing it. It releases endorphins. You know, when when the cat, uh, the feel good chemicals, when they are. Um, uh, if they're if they're hurting, so it could be that they're you know licking their paws because they actually have pain there, or it could be a way to just generally make them feel selves feel better. Like going for a run increases you your to. mood. Hmm? Yeah, it might be, the paw might be all they can get to. Yeah, exactly. And that, um, yeah. but you know, it, it, it's so oftentimes like when there's when they're grooming in here, uh, you know, it, a lot of it's oftentimes if it's on both paws, I often think they're they're distressed, like they're something's upsetting them. And they're trying to soothe themselves and it's right there so it's really easy but if they're grooming you know over their kidney or something like that it may be that the spine there hurts or the kidney hurts or something something like that yeah, and you know i don't think i don't think we have a side of this in here but i want to talk a little bit about stress in cats mm. um because a lot of people see their cat is getting old and frail and they're like you know you know it'd be really great we should get a kitten mm. um, Mm, yeah, if you want, if you're going to do that, get two kittens, because it's all of a sudden, it's like if you're used to having a nice stayed life, comfortable, everything's ordered, orderly, and you have your routine, and all of a sudden, um, a grandchild moves in with you, 
you know, <laughs> whoa. So if you have, you know, they haven't learned uh, manners yet as to where boundaries are and things. So if you get a kitten, um, the, the kitten will pester the older cat. The older cat will become stressed by it. it could, uh, if you get two kittens, though, the kittens can play with each other. The older cat can leave and not not be bothered with the uh, buyer with them, but or they, they may just sit there, watch and be amused. Um, and then every now and then hiss or swat out, but it's, but rather than having this kitten bouncing on them, chewing their ears, you know, chewing their tail or something <laughs> like that, because they, because they're a kitten and that's what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what else can we look for? Well, we can also look for, you know, squinting uh, could be, you know, if, if cats have this sort of like when you or I have a headache, you can see it, you know, it's a, you've said your daughters know when you have a migraine, they can just yeah. sort of see it. This, this, it's this amazing. Tension. I can just walk in the room and they're like, mom, you have a headache? Yeah. Like, well, it's because it's this tension here and I'll show, I'll show you some pictures of, of that in a second. Um, being, you know, hunched up or tucked up in like sort of being in a, um, either an arched back when they're sleeping um, on the, uh, uh, in their, what I like to call bread loaf or meat loaf, um, as opposed to just being really relaxed in it or being um, uh, croissant shape kind of thing, uh, <laughs> crescent shaped or, um, uh, or being a, a bagel. A lot of bread goes on with cats. <laughs> What they need, right? So you know, they're, I think yeah. the bakers in their own perfect. Um, if you're, if they, 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 they speak when you touch them somewhere, or they flinch, or they, um, or they guard themselves when when you uh, you uh, pet them somewhere or touch them somewhere, or just changes in their temperament, you know, um, which sort of summarizes all the all the other things. But there's a really great resource uh, that's available for you here too at catfriendly.com, which is part of catvets.com it's afp and this is a uh, keep your cat healthy no cat pain that's where this is this you can get this from uh how do i know if my cat is in pain that's a really really good one so now i outed the people who got kittens because their cats were getting old and bridget's feeling badly about it so <laughs> she she got a kitten when her cat was there it's their two years down the down the road and the kitten's still bothering her older cat yeah, well, maybe you could you could consider, um, but again, there's no guarantees that your uh, there's no guarantees that the uh, Maine Coon will um, like another uh, cat coming in. But you know, you could. This is why getting the kittens together when they're totally open to to other cats is a uh, is is a is a great thing. But uh, I mean, I would look at then getting a young adult, sort of somebody who's like one or one and a half years of age, um, who's still sort of open to the whole idea of, or maybe you know even. 10 months of age, who's open to the idea of, um, uh, who, who's under, who's learned manners, but that your main coon might get along with without pestering, um, hopefully wouldn't pester the, the uh, senior kitty. And I think that we forget that cats are actually solitary survivors. Exactly. They're not necessarily meant to have exactly. other cat friends. Exactly. So exactly. it wouldn't be a wrong thing to do to give your older cat a timeout space yeah. where they can have some time in the day away from the wild one. Um, it might actually help everything. A wild child. <laughs> I may or may not have been a wild child. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it might help your other cat to get some rest and sleep uninterrupted um, and have your meal, have their meals even in separate places. Very definitely. I mean, separated, uh, separated resource stations is super important. Cats never want to be eating side by side. They don't want to see the threat to their resources out of the corner of their eye. You know, well, well, so, well, my cats eat, are happy to eat side by side. No, they're not happy, but they will because that's where f food is an essential resource. But they should probably be eating in different rooms. I have had heated, I wouldn't say fights, and there's never been a punch thrown, but I've had very heated arguments about that with even feline veterinarians who think that feeding cats together is going to decrease stress and, and help cats no. get along. No, totally not. It's simply not. Uh, who they are you know they hunt alone and they eat alone it's, it's who they are so so if they're if they're eating alone you're you are putting them in, i mean eating together you're putting them in a stressful situation so yeah. even if they're tolerating each other there yeah they may exhibit stress behavior somewhere else yeah so exactly that, they may right. develop the uh they may develop the idiopathic cystitis you know, painful bladder, they may develop uh, inflammatory bowel, they may develop asthma, they may develop something else that is, uh, you wouldn't think has anything to do with, with, um, you know, we tend to think of inflammatory bowel as being something with the bowel. Well, it's got a lot to do with stress. So yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. So what, there's some new there's some new stuff happening about being able to tell how cats are in pain. For sure. This is something you want to go to felinegrimacescale.com. They've got how to use this. Um, uh, at re it's really, really amazing. It's work out of Montreal where they look at like the cat on the left is not in pain. The cat in the middle and the cat on the right are in pain in varying degrees. The one on the right is in more severe pain. And what you're doing is you're, you're scoring them uh, based on the ear position, which as you can see, goes more and more out to the side. This isn't a mad cat. This is a painful cat. Okay, um, here the aperture when I talked about squinting, this is what I was meaning here, how the eye opening gets gets smaller and, and what well, gets narrower and the whisker position as a cat's in pain, their whiskers start to uh, their, their, their cheeks get more poochy, they get more tense. And so that moves the whiskers. And as opposed to them being nice and relaxed and forward, they can get really, really um, tense. Uh, and, and they may be forward or back, but they get really tense. So looking no. at whiskers here, you can see that the difference in these in these cats and where they're. I think this are. is one of the most amazing things that's happening in, yeah. with cats right now, because yeah. you and I say all the time for years, cats are masters at hiding their pain. Yeah. And yeah. now that we have these tools, I'm like, are they? Or do we just stink at reading their signs? We haven't, they don't show it the way we think Expect of it. Expect to see it. They're speaking yeah. a different language. Once we've learned that language, it's easy to detect, yeah. right? But we have to learn the language. Things, that yeah. is really clear. And now that I've yeah. been studying it, I can see it like that. But before yeah. I yeah. knew it, I, I couldn't yeah. tell anything. Yeah. I, I just think that this is an amazing development. Yeah. And Bridget's asked a really important, really important question. How can you tell the difference between pain and anxiety? And that's especially in a veterinary clinic. You know, we don't know whether the cat is is being um, self-defensive because of pain or because of anxiety or because of both. And so we we don't know. And with, with pain, we want to try and identify the source of the pain and alleviate the pain you know, get rid of the pain, treat the pain, and then see um, uh, if there, uh, what else is going on. And some, it's, it's especially difficult in, in, the, in the clinic. And also, sometimes, you know, it may look like somebody, is, it, it can be really harder to tell too, if somebody's got a bad cold and their eyes are all goopy and they're, you know, they're having a hard time breathing, it may look like it's pain when in fact, it's, it's a really bad, really bad um, cold. So, yeah. I want to circle back around to, to the eating Kristen yeah. is asking if eating, uh, you know, what we should do more on eating. Cat eating is mm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and she was pain saying, and blood pressure. <laughs> she was <laughs> saying that uh, uh, separating our cats when they're eating and seeing if that's going to help with the behavior issues that she's having at home. Um, and it's not just they're solitary hunters. They hunt alone. They eat alone. And they eat multiple small meals a day that they seek out. Yeah. interact with and then eat yeah and that has impacts on their entire existence yeah um and so if you want to learn more about that you can google me because i talk about it all the time <laughs> or In, indoor hunting is what we really want to create we don't want them to have a, a bowl full of food we want them to engage with their meal and uh you know rather than just open up a <laughs> open up a TV dinner or whatever, if those things still exist, I don't even know. But, um, <laughs> you know, to, we want, we need them to interact with their food. So we talk, so many people and and certainly um, pet food companies are talking about uh, cats as predators. And you see the great ads of the cats, like, you know, first you see a, a lynx or something, and then you see a house cat. So we talk about, they talk about pre predatory food. So it's protein. But it's actually the predation also. It's the behavior. Yeah, it's the it's the behavior for sure, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Sarah, when with with moving food bowls uh, from far away to closer as a component of cat introductions, we can do that with um, uh, yes, but not to so they're side by side. And we can do that actually with swapping smells. So where you where you wipe the um, each cat with a different face cloth, and then you. Uh, cross over and wipe the other cat with the other cat's face cloth kind of thing to get some smell. Um, uh, the other thing that we want to do is give them what's better is to give them um, um, 
some, you know, catnip, a catnip sock or filled sock or something like that. And so they can just relax and see out of the corner of their eyes, the, the other cat, but we don't want food. Food is hunt alone and eat alone, but we do want to encourage them to interact, but in different ways. And there is some differences of opinion here or, um, you know, people that mean well, but aren't up to um, the latest in the information. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, like a cat on a tree. Hey. And so I just don't think you should ask your cats to eat together. Mm -mm. And um, I don't think that's going to help any behavior issues. Like you said, there's a lot of other ways that we can get them to uh, accept each other. Um, you're more likely to have problems if you ask them to eat together than if you don't. Yeah. Um, so we, we are getting a lot of questions about how do we actually, and I know this isn't really um, senior cat stuff, but, but how do we actually imitate that predation? In a way though it is because um, even older cats should move and even older cats should be able to um, have their normal behavior uh, you just wouldn't want to um, ask them to, you know, hide and uh, seek out things and climb in places they can't get to. Um, but what do you think about older cats hunting for their food? They could do it. I think, it, I, I believe, where was it? Um, do, 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 do. Was it Brooke who said, oh, yeah, Brooke said, do lick mats and puzzle feeders fall into that interactive form? And yeah, absolutely. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they go racing around the house for it. Um, hopefully they do feel up to it and they don't have a whole lot of pain or the, or whatever is causing the joint pain is or that we're dealing with the pain from that from arthritis, etc. Um, but they can, you know, to, they for them to use a, uh, you know, puzzle feeder, um, and you can go to, uh, oh, uh, uh, what is it, Liz? The uh, uh, cat feeders. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, um, Hang on one sec. I'll just get this up yeah. here. And I, can, this. I, I, I food, food puzzles for cat, food, food puzzles, puzzles for cats, yeah. uh, food puzzles for cats.com. Um, but, you know, I can just show you also straight up. I've got a, a bunch of things, but actually, they've got some some food in in this one right there and uh, uh jules was just just in here eating from from this one and this is you know liz's version for 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 wet food as well and so the thing the only i mean we'll talk about all this more another time but um hunting is different than playing to me the seeking process is different than the just interactive so i think they both have a place and if your cat is having trouble getting around um, then just using some kind of interactive thing for your cats to eat is great. It really is. The, they'll, and the more they, uh, they use their brain and they use their body in a way that is age appropriate yeah. and, and, and body appropriate, they, yeah. they actually they get better. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So when we look at, you know, further, um, to, you know, further weight loss, nutrition, we've got so many things we could cover here, don't we? No. Uh, risks for, you know, risks for losing weight, things that can cause them to lose weight or pain, dental disease and decreased ability to absorb nutrients. So, um, uh, someone was talking about, uh, uh have their 17 year old cat lose it, it being down to five pounds and whether that was, uh, you know, and is hardly eating anymore. What, what could um, she do? And certainly appetite stimulants, but also looking at um, more nutritionally dense foods and calculating, getting your veterinarian to calculate how many calories your cat needs for their ideal weight per day, and then finding, a, converting that into the amount of, um, the amount of food that that uh, is, is equivalent to. You, know, you talked earlier about, um, about loss of sense of smell and taste. And um, there's some just management tricks you can try too. Of if you're feeding any kind of wet food, you can warm it. Mm -hmm. And when you warm stuff, that makes the the um, scent stronger and more aerosolized. And so the cat might want to eat it more if it's warm. What other tricks can you use? If you talked about appetite stimulants, that would be something. Well, that it can also be. It can also be as simple as you know maybe that the kitty can't. Uh, reach the food so well because of, in this case, arthritis in the in the neck here. So if you raise the bowl, it makes it easier for for her to eat and have it on a non-slip surface um, as well. Really, uh, really important there. Yeah, we that's also, something we really think about: is can they even get to the bowl? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or is it th too threatening? Is there's, is it, is the bowl maybe near a, uh, a an appliance that makes sudden noise or is it that, that, uh, they have to go past an area that they feel a little anxious about because a kid's in there or because, you know, there's a whole lot of traffic. Like, why do we feed them in the kitchen? Quit feeding them in the kitchen. Cats want to, well, they don't catch a bird and then, you know, take it to a, whole, a really social place. They catch a bird <laughs> and eat it far away where no one is going to bother them. And that's how we should be feeding our cats inside. You know, it, I'm thinking about um, geriatric people and how like, you know, someone would just walk down a hallway and what's the big deal. But if you're worried about your body and mm -hmm. you can't get out of the way in time or you're, you're kind of tottery with your balance and you don't want someone to knock you over, yeah. then you know, actually being in a, a place with a lot of commotion to eat is scary. You know, what if someone comes up to you and you can't move quickly enough and get away? You know, there's a yeah. there's a lot to it. It's it's yeah. not necessarily just one thing. Yeah, no, for sure. There's a, there's a lot of psychological um, stuff, stuff going on there. Um, and and then, you know, dental disease, which we've already mentioned before, uh, knowing, you know, I, I mean, perhaps people don't realize that as many as 70 percent of cats have already have periodontal disease or other things reservative lesions and other things by three years of age. It is so, so super common. And, you know, I want to say here too, because I, I, I love my cat parents. And when we talk about dental disease um, in cats, we don't do all the same stuff typically that we do for people. So usually teeth have to be pulled and you think it, it feels to a lot of people like an amputation. Like it's like, oh, that it just, you're going to pull teeth. This, this terrible. I want to tell you, we get those teeth out and healed properly. And in a lot of times you have a new cat. You mm, really absolutely. Do. The pain that, that, that dental disease. And is the, causing yeah. And the inflammation, just the inflammation that affects your whole body, you know, with this, with this inflammation. Yeah. So don't get too attached to your cat's teeth. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, over seven years of age, they commonly have periodontal disease and tooth resorption, which is like cavities in us. Uh, and then advancing age is not, is not a barrier to dental, to an anesthesia and dental. Uh, even if somebody's got kidney disease or hyperthyroidism or something like that, or diabetes, you can still anesthetize them. I cannot believe how many People still tell um, still tell pet parents that their cat is too old to, or it's too risky to anesthetize them. It is not. You just need to do appropriate um, yeah. workups and and supportive care beforehand and monitor them during the anesthetic. You think about the people who gets all of the who which group of people which age group has the most anesthetics. You know, bypass surgeries, hip replacements, knee replacements, yada, yada, yada. And that's, you know, cancer, all this kind of stuff. That tends to be the older people. Age is not a, a risk for, for anesthesia. You just have to do things differently. So I think we want to we want to say it might not be something that your vet wants to get into because the anesthesia given different health conditions can be very complicated. And you guys probably don't. You, how would you know this? But when you go to have surgery, you're, you have like, I don't even know how many people are in that room. Yeah. Human doctors are very spoiled. So you would have, you'd have the surgeon, you have an assistant, you have nurses, you, and you have an anesthetist. You, have an anesthetist, you also have an anesthetist assistant as well, plus the nurses. Yeah. And often um, in a veterinary hospital, the doctor and one technician are doing everything. And so if the, if the anesthesia is very scientifically complicated, it might not be appropriate to do at a local hospital. It might. Some places have the capability of doing it and some don't. So well, the, if other, the other thing too, that we, we tend to forget about is that <clears throat> with, if, if there's a lot of work that needs to be done, it can be staged. You don't have to do the, all of the teeth at, at one visit under one anesthetic. You don't have to do all of the, whatever the surgery is, depending on what the surgery is, you know, like it's, it's same, the same thing as us. You may, you may do the, the dentist may do these two teeth today. And then, t you know, two weeks from now you go back for a couple of other teeth or whatever. There's no, there, there are board certified, uh, veterinary dentists veterinary and, dentists. and, and too. but if yes. you're but board certified veterinary dentists, they deal with these tricky cases all the time all the time. And so yeah, they, they're Harvey really was asking if her cat has heart disease, if 
it can have anesthesia. And I mean, if you again go to your example of humans, um, you get anesthesia to have a valve replacement. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and 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 this is it. I mean, dogs with heart disease. You know, like you think the King Cavalier Spaniels and stuff. They with that they have anesthesia for their heart disease all the time. The other thing I want to mention is, is that to dental be, X-rays are super, super, super important. They should be. Uh, um, they should be. Uh, uh, it's a point of contention too in the community, in the vet community, because they're expensive. And so providing proper care, uh, something might be better than nothing. It's, it's this tricky business because it gets expensive. But if you don't take dental x-rays, there's a lot of information that it is not possible to know. Yeah. And so root tooth roots can be left behind. Um, uh, all, I mean, we could go on and on and on about how important a dental x-ray is. It's there for a reason. So um, we get in that tough spot between money and good care. Um, yeah. But but I'm a huge fan of dental x-rays. Yeah. Oh, it's it, it's essential. You don't know because a lot of times the, uh, a lot of times the uh, uh, lesions are underneath the gum. And so you can't see that. And which is why you may look that, that may look like there's a little bit of plaque, maybe a tiny bit of redness around the gums, but otherwise it's fine. Um, but without x-rays, you simply don't know. Cause you also can't probe in an, in an awake cat. You can't probe and see, oh, look, there's a pocket there. Um, you just, just don't know, just don't know those things at all. So, yeah, um, we don't have a you know ton of. No, of we're over. Are you and me? We get going and like. Yeah, I know we can just go on, and and there's just so much. We we just are so fast, so um, uh, we just love this stuff so so much. Love our kitties so much, and love helping them. Um, as, uh, there've been a couple of questions about how often should cats get their you know have have blood work or or be seen and stuff. And, and just like with us, the best protection is early detection. And so when we look, here's a table from the AAFP um, uh, senior uh, or life stage guidelines, which, um, uh, and this, this talk shows here, if we look at, you know, seniors on the far right, but let's just look at before that too. When we look at a comprehensive, um, comprehensive physical exam should be being done that has to be on here too, and it's not. But when we're just looking at the, the, the lab work, a complete blood count and biochemistries, um, a urinalysis, uh, these, these should be uh, done um, as needed in, in young adults, but then definitely we're looking at uh, one to every, every year or two for our mature uh, seven to 10 year olds and our seniors, we're definitely looking at at least every six months, twice a year. We need to be doing doing these things. Blood pressure, uh, again, depending on who, who you talk to, like the International Society of Feline Medicine recommends doing blood pressure from three years of age onwards. And um, that's not so much to, um, that is in part to get the cats used to having this done so that it's less freaky for them. Um, also because some of the conditions uh, such as kidney disease and, uh, and thyroid disease that can be, um, uh, that are associated with higher blood pressure, although cats can also have just high blood pressure unrelated to anything else, uh, they may be uh, starting to show up um, uh, as soon as, you know, six years of age, but usually not. So these are, you know, hopefully this, this table is, is of use to you. Yeah. You know, um, while you're taking your sip there, I, there's been so much questions about, about food and we're asked, getting asked over and over about the food bowl website. That is uh, food puzzles for cats. And um, this has been my whole life's work actually. So if, um, uh, if the base pause folks can- um, I just put it in there. There we go. Great. Um, I'm, I want to give away one of the hunting feeders, which is the, the mice that um, Dr. Sherrick showed you. It comes in a kit with three and you you put uh, a scoop in each one and hide them around the house. You do it in the morning and you do it at night to keep them hunting. So um, if you've answered anything in the chat, um, Base Pause is going to pick one of you and send me your info and then you're going to have to give me your address because I don't I haven't stalked you. I don't know where you live. Um, and, uh, and I will, um, I will give away a hunting feeder. So, um, you got, you guys are amazing. Like the, the amount of care and enthusiasm that I'm reading in the chat, I guess, you know, we've both been locked up for a long time. So, so even, even someone typing something is like, yay. <laughs> exactly. So true. So true. Um, just to give you an idea of like how, why this is so super important. They, the, the, yeah. um, the, 
there was a study done in apparently healthy cats from uh, six years of age on, 100 apparently healthy cats. And in this study, um, so these cats were apparently healthy, um, 100 cats from six years of age onwards. And look at what they found. These were cats with no clinical signs because cats are so great at hiding stuff. 8% of them had high blood pressure. Um, wow. 20% of them had uh, thyroid goiters and, uh, and, and 3% of, uh, with, with actually, were actually hyperthyroid. Um, 25% of them had protein in the urine. And that's, that's really surprising to me because that's um, not all that common. 11% had heart murmurs. Um, a lot of heart murmurs in, in cats are benign, but still we need to know about them. 29% um, of them had increased kidney enzymes. That one blows me away. Blows that me. Blows Part me of away. that could have been dehydration, but nonetheless, that was still there. 25% uh, had high blood sugars. Some of that will have been stressed, um, uh, but at, at least 3% of the, well, there was also sugar in the urine uh, in 3% in of them, although that can also be stressed. 32% uh, had enlarged lymph nodes in their submandibular lymph nodes, and that's because they had will be from dental disease. And then 14%, 14% of them were FIV positive, which blows my mind. Blows and my these mind. are these are seniors. So they've lived their most, you know, in general, that's a disease that's transmitted through sexual contact or fighting. So yeah. um, mostly these older cats, uh, that's they've not- They've had it for a long time. time. Yeah. So they've had this a long time. You know, we we were supposed to be an hour, already an hour and 10 minutes. Um, but I'm looking through, if you've noticed me looking down, I have my cheat sheet of Dr. Sherrick's slides, and you still have some a lot of really great information. Well, I thought we could um, just maybe do the next two, because really the stuff after that is a topic in and unto itself. Okay. I thought, you know, maybe like doing treatable disease. I'm happy to stay on. I just don't. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe don't someone from Yes Plus can... I don't know if they have, um, you know, the the amount of time that we're using the service might be an, an issue. So someone from Base Pause can just put in the chat whether you'd like us to keep going or we should uh, we should reschedule, you know, schedule another one. Um, right. All right. They said take your time. Okay. So awesome. Can... That's great. So <laughs> some of your cats, in other words, they can be hiding chronic kidney disease, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, dental diseases, arthritis, and high blood pressure. So we need to get them in and check them every six months or, or even every, uh, um, every four months once they uh, start, you know, once they are 14 um, uh, of uh, years. This of is my, this is my stick your head in the sand um, uh, anti-venom. These are treatable diseases. Yeah. Yeah. So if we find out and, and come up with a plan, we can we can extend your cat's quality and quantity of life. Yeah. Um, so th that and that's really the whole thing, right? That's really the whole point. I love yeah. that. I love this slide because you know, for people like me who are avoidant, it, treatable, uh, treatable. That's what we're yeah. after, right? Um, oops, what have I done here? <laughs> okay, let's just get, get along here. So, but you know, it's it's this is why I love the the, the term from my um, uh, client, uh, appropriate, age appropriate, because cats are living longer, chronic conditions come along with being, being, uh, as getting older, and there's often more than, more than one thing going on. You know what, I think you and I have to work on this. We're good at coming up with language because we, when, whenever we get news that our, our cats or ourselves or whatever have a problem, it is like, oh my gosh, my cat has kidney disease. And we feel like it's, uh, like it's, uh, you know, never happened to anyone else. It's the most terrible thing in the world. And it's not super, I'm not going to lie, but, but these age appropriate diseases, um, it's okay. It's okay. We just need to know about them and treat them and, and, and hang in there. Um, I, uh, we're, we're going to work on that. We're going to come up with a good a good word that takes the anxiety the human anxiety down a little bit yeah. well um, i think it's appropriate really sums it up right just because it is something we expect um yeah. to, to, to happen but yeah we should be so it's not normal yeah no, diseases aren't normal but uh but it's age appropriate well except you know there are the two articles that i was involved in writing with um uh um bunch of like um, other Jan Bellows and others uh, a couple of years ago, which talk about um, healthy aging. Mm. Okay. And what is, you know, and we had a really hard time determining 
uh, like for instance, the, the changes the in eyes and irises, the 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 um, thinning of the irises in cats, and the getting the the cloudiness in the lenses, which is not the same thing as as cataracts in in cats. Um, the those those things are normal age appropriate changes. They're still healthy cats. Those are that's healthy aging. I don't know if you guys all caught this, but the doctor who's talking to you right now is the one who writes the articles. Oh. <laughs> she, you're, I, I think you should be a movie star. A rock, you're my rock star. You are my rock star. Um, the, what you've done for, for cats and for spreading the word. And um, uh, in case you all haven't met Dr. Sherrick in person, um, you always lay it out there, even if it's not popular for what's in the best interest of the cat. And um, that's hard to hear sometimes. It makes some people mm. uncomfortable, but it mm. you're always right. You're yeah. always right. And it's always ch changing, ch op op open to changing because there's, uh, I'm, a bit ahead, I'm a bit ahead of the curve, but um, I have to always be, be uh, open to, to changes as we learn more and I learn from you and I learn from others. And, and this is, this is a, a, a good thing. So I think, you know, we need to, what we were going to do was uh, also talk about um, quality of life. And that's, uh, I think, going to need to be a, a, a different time. And I don't know why my slide is not changing. Yeah, I'm going to talk, talk we'll, we'll talk to the folks at Base Paws about this because yeah. this is really important. Um, and how, you know, I bet every one of you who is here tonight thinks, how do I know when it's time? Exactly. Right? You know, most of us are going to outlive our cats. And so there's a lot of decision making and really hard stuff. And, um, I love that you've put this together and want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things we all try to just pretend it doesn't exist. And I just want my kitty to die in their sleep and, um, it but it should really work out that way. And yeah. so, um, uh, we'll find a way to come back and cover this yeah. whole topic because yeah. it's really important. Yeah, because it's really important to diagnose things early to, to so that we can treat them um, and uh, and and make cats make cats uh, really comfortable with it. Uh, but we also need to know who are we doing this for when it's no longer for in the cat's best interest. We need to fess up to that. But I just wanted to, you know, sort of maybe we can finish with this one, which is that, you know, senior senior cats are the best. They are the best. I think they are anyway. Uh, that, um, you know, with that, that, that signs of sickness are, are subtle. Um, we need to look for changes in mobility and other things that related to pain. Weigh your cat regularly. Regular checkups are a must. Screening. So we need to, you know, the best protection is early detection. Um, and we need to also be thinking about quality of life uh, and uh, that, um, uh, you know, and how to how to have a, a wonderful um, end end of life, too. Yeah. And I'm going to put it out there. I want to talk about it. I want to talk yeah. about a, be a beautiful goodbye, a beautiful yeah, goodbye. Exactly. So um, you may have heard my computer ding and I'm really sorry for that. But I had set my um, my do not disturb for an hour and we're, you know, we're almost an hour and 20 minutes. So rock on. Sorry about yeah. the ding, but we just can't stop. Ding um, dong. <laughs> I'm, I am endlessly grateful to Base Paws because until Base Paws, it was really hard to get veterinary quality information and people like you out to the public. And Base Paws well, is doing- Well, the thing is, I mean, we've, we've got this amazing group of people who love their cats uh, and we have an opportunity to um, engage and, uh, um, and share information and help those cats. This is why, you know, we get to be a pebble in the pond where our ripples affect cats and people we're never going to see, but we can do good that way. So, and, and, you know, I think that sometimes when we, we might feel like we're talking into the wind and um, it makes me so excited to see how many people uh, are, are thirsty for the knowledge and for what really care and for what we have to say. So yeah. thank you guys. I love being here. I love talking to you. I love any excuse that I can to spend an hour with Dr. Sherrick. Um, hey, likewise, you know that. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I, I think I've just invited you back, even though it's not mine to invite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you guys, take a look at the base pause new health markers because that that's another thing that there's really going to be an interesting tool um this is science in the making and having this dna available um you know we can tell a few uh, you know, now 120 things to look for um and a marker doesn't mean it's going to happen a marker means that it's something that we need to be on the lookout for because it's it more likely to happen 
Um, and uh, and what we're going to do with this knowledge that is being accumulated um, is amazing. And stay tuned, buckle up, because I, I, I'm very, very excited. Uh, Base Pause is hoping that by 2025, that um, we can we can have living to 25 years old as a goal. I think that's mind blowing, and and uh, shoot for the stars. But you know, for most of us, if we got an extra day, it would be With worth her it. Kitties. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So everybody, go go give your cat an air kiss. Not every cat wants to be kissed or hugged, but uh, <laughs> give them a slow blink from me. And uh, I can't wait to see you all next time. Thank you, Dr. Sherrick. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bales. Bye, Thanks. guys.